is Jonathan Farr, and I'm the uh, Senior Policy Analyst for Climate Change uh, in WaterAid, based in the UK. And um, it's uh, absolutely my my pleasure to be part of the uh, Gobachana Conference uh, that's taken place this week, and is a really exciting event. And uh, maybe maybe Dr. Dr. Hart will talk about that um, later. First of all, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping and agenda. So. We're, uh, we're going to have in a moment a, um, a, a, a short introduction then we, uh, from, from Priya Nath, then we're going to have a panel discussion and there'll be plenty of time left for questions and answers. So please, if you do have any questions, uh, it, they'll cut, if it starts off about 45, 50 minutes, then please either put them in the chat or hold them and you'll get uh, space to, to ask uh, any of the panelists or all of the panelists uh, any questions that you may, ha may have. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll just... Um, talk about this what the session is for which is to take things in reverse order first of all that uh, as as many of you know climate change is is water change many of the impacts of climate change will take place either you know increasing droughts increasing floods increasing storms and uh, people with, uh, with with delicate or even non-existent access to water services will be the first people to feel those impacts and be the le people least able to bounce back from them. So we need to have resilient water services. Uh, that's certainly the position of water aid. Um, so uh, the other thing is that whilst climate change is a global problem, the impacts are very contextual, they're very local. And the people who will know best about you know, their relationship to the climate uh, will be will be local people and communities and also the first people to respond if there's a problem will also be those same people and so therefore it's only right and proper that that we involve communities uh, in uh, in plans for their climate resilience in decisions that get made and in shaping those uh, the courses of their their own futures uh, but of course that's it has to be meaningful that's you know, it's very easy to say we should be inclusive it's very easy to say we should work with communities but uh, actually in practice it's something that's a continuous process and that is why it's my uh, my pleasure to introduce first of all uh priya nath who is uh, who uh works for water aid as a, a senior advisor advisor for uh equality uh inclusion and rights uh she's been patiently working with water aid's country programs over a number of years to try and improve the way that we engage with communities and the people the different groups within those communities uh and then following Priya, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Huck will give a short uh, presentation for the panel. Then uh, uh, Angie Sharma from the uh, G Global, Com Global Center Adaptation. And then lastly, uh, uh, our Bangladesh Country Director, uh, Hassan Jahan, who of course has been working through all this uh, through Water Aid's work as well. So in that, uh, with no further ado, I'll turn to Priya to give her opening presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm just sharing my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see it now. We can see it, but it's in app mode as opposed to presentation mode. Sorry, there's just a bit of a delay. So let me try again. There we go. That was good. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Priya Nath. As Jonathan said, I work for WaterAid as well with a focus on equality and inclusion in our programs and in our organization. So it's my pleasure to be here today and to join you to learn more about locally led adaptations and uh, particularly how these can be strengthened from, a, from the viewpoint of those who are often most excluded or most marginalized from water sanitation and hygiene and also within climate um, adaptations and mitigation measures. So I just wanna start by talking about WaterAid's approach. We have been working on water sanitation and hygiene for many, many years now. And very early on, we have discovered obviously that taps and toilets, the hardware is not enough. That it is the social relations and the social issues that surround the use of taps and toilets and hand washing stations that have a big impact on how people can actually access their water sanitation and hygiene needs, how well they can meet them and how well those water sanitation and hygiene infrastructure actually respond to their very specific requirements as human beings, as individuals, as members of particular communities. So we have for now a long time 
almost 15 years, put working in a rights-based way at the center of our approach. This means that we recognize that water and sanitation are human rights. They are human rights for everyone, regardless of their identity, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their gender, their disability status, their health status. So that requires us to work with both the duty bearers, those service providers and the governments that have a responsibility as mandated by the human rights to water and sanitation to deliver water and sanitation, but also with the rights holders. So all of the people in all of their diversity to ensure that those services actually respond to their requirements and that they can have some say in these services. We take a focus on, we do this also by taking a focus on who is excluded from water sanitation and why. So we need to do a lot of work as WaterAid and as any WASH uh, service provider or any WASH uh, NGO or community service organization, we need to do a lot of work to really be assessing the barriers that some people experience to being able to fulfill their WASH requirements. We need to understand those barriers for different types of people, whether they that's it's for women, whether it's for specific castes, whether it's for people with specific health conditions or specific disability impairments, we need to understand what the barriers are. We need to also understand the political economy, who has power and control over services. And often this is not just about the formal power, but the informal power and control over services or shaping the services or access to or location of those services. And of course, we need to understand the gender differentials. So how do women and men uh, experience these services or need these services? And how is that different from men's need for those services and their experience of those services? This, this gender differentiated analysis analysis is very important to be able to then respond in a way that is gender responsive, gender inclusive, and doesn't further exacerbate gender inequalities. And I say this again in this next bullet point that we pay, we are trying to very much pay attention to the gender inequality and the power relations that exist at the different levels of the WASH system, whether it's household level, whether it's community level, whether it's subnational or national level. We have to be mindful that gender inequality and power relations exist everywhere, in every community, in every society, in every part of the world. And these things have an impact then on people's experience experiences and people's ability to have a say on their services. And then overall, our approach is to work to strengthen the WASH system as a whole to tackle the inequalities that exist in WASH, just as they exist in any other basic service that uh, people rely on for survival. This diagram shows something that we call our steps to inclusive wash. So we've been working, as I said, for over 15 years and trying to understand and adapt and uh, un to better deliver wash that is more inclusive to the different um, parts of the population. So when we talk about community led or locally led, this is not one homogenous group. Obviously, we have we understand that this is made up of very diverse groups of people, very di diverse genders, diverse ability status, diverse health status, diverse um, income status. So we need to be more mindful of that diversity that in it exists at any within any community, within any, any local uh, grouping of people. So our approach is to try to follow as much as possible these steps. And we start with um, being sure that we as WaterAid and the partners that we work with are really understanding and seeing this from a human rights approach to WASH and applying this. So it's not about uh, any kind of, you know, th that, it's, that it's about uh, charity that people get their WASH. It's about, it's a right. And that has to be the, the central part of our focus. But then we also have to make sure that we as WaterAid and our partners and anyone we're working with have the skills and confidence to understand what inclusive WASH looks like. What does inclusive water services look like and why do they need those fe features to be inclusive? And then we also try and work alongside groups and communities, marginalized groups and individuals so that they are also aware that WASH is their right, that they have these rights and, that, and how they might go about accessing them. This is um, so talk it, thinking about improving our own uh, understanding and our own capacity. And then the second row is more around looking at things that are features of 
uh, making sure people are involved in service design, making sure people are being able to participate equally in our programming, in our approaches, and that actually we move towards a situation where WASH services are have being co-designed uh, by the people that use them, not just by service providers or, or INGOs like ourselves. So this is more around, you know, thinking about strong WASH management committees and activities uh, so that, that marginalized groups and individuals can actively participate in, and ways in which we as water or our partners collaborate with uh, organizations representing marginalized people or groups or individuals so that we can better understand their requirements. Um, and then the third row is more around um, systems change. So not thinking about just the individual or just local community, but thinking about the WASH sector as a as a whole and what needs to change in that WASH sector, in that broader WASH environment to make sure that uh, it is more um, it is more conducive to being inclusive of people in their diversity. To how, what needs to change in that WASH system to make, make sure that decision makers are more aware of their role and responsibility to deliver inclusive WASH, not just WASH, but inclusive WASH, so that we can end up in a situation where inclusive WASH for all is something that is sustainable, that is something implemented at a systems level, not just at a at a uh, individual level or a within one community, but it but it is something that is uh, bigger and broader and sustainable. We borrow this approach on the screen here uh, from a lot of work that's already been done by many, many people and academics, activists and uh, international and national organizations around this, what they call a journey towards transformation. It's used heavily by gender equality experts and gender equality organizations. And we borrow this and we apply this also to our work on WASH. We have to understand that it takes time, investment, and a very intentional approach. So we try and fit our work into understanding, first of all, where are we being harmful and how do we make sure that we avoid that harmful uh, approaches? How do we avoid approaches that might use existing stereotypes and existing roles and responsibilities and then just exacerbate the burden on some people. That would be a harmful outcome. So we try and make sure that at a minimum, we are thinking about inclusion. We're thinking about equal participation, equal inclusion within WASH. But ultimately, we want to strive for WASH, water, sanitation, hygiene outcomes that are more empowering, that they actually do something to tackle the current unequal relationships relationships in WASH, that they do something to change people's power in relation to WASH. And then finally, we might contribute, we might as a WASH organization contribute to greater transformation, a greater change in the power imbalances that might hold some people back, particularly women and girls or people with disabilities. So that is a model that we borrow from outside and we try to apply more and more to our work to make sure that we're not just going in blind, but we see it as a journey and it's something that takes time and investment. I'm sure to this audience, I don't need to really go um, into much detail about these, but we obviously have recognized in our work that WASH and gender, uh, WASH and gender are very interrelated. And so too is the reliance on natural resources and the reliance on WASH services. So it has a very strong gender dimension that wash, water, sanitation and, high, and hygiene are heavily gendered resources. That means that their, their use is very much um, dictated by whether we're man or woman, girl or boy or, or third gender. These impact on our use. These impact because there are biological factors that mean that women and girls need actually more clean and safe water and clean and safe sanitation places to be able to manage their personal hygiene requirements, especially during menstruation. They're impacted because we know that gender roles and responsibilities in the household, in the community, mean that women are often more reliant on natural resources. So women are often the most, uh, the people that are doing the labor 
labor that subsidizes poor water infrastructure and services. And this will only increase with climate change. This will only get worse. Their burden, their labor will be required more when there is climate impacts on the already poor infrastructure that might be in existence. Um, and obviously that because of the role in the household, the domestic labor that women and girls do, they're more reliant on the water and the wash services. So a scarcity in this area is going to impact them directly. It's going to impact their time. It's going to impact their ability to do their role in the household. And it might also lead to other friction. Um, and it also impacts them because they have a greater responsibility, greater role in, in most communities as caregivers. They do the caring. So if people are getting more sick, if, if um, health status is um, is getting worse due to poor water quality or salinity or other factors, then obviously that is going to increase their load as well. Uh, and but then despite all of that, in the wash sector more broadly, we know that most of the technical, as in most technical sectors, most of the people working in these um, sectors, the decision makers, the technical experts, the planners, the engineers, majority are men still. So that gender perspective sometimes doesn't come in as strongly at the decision making level that it needs to to respond to the reality of those services on the ground. So finally, I just want to um, move into the, the panel discussion and just talk about how equality and inclusion is so important for any adaptation measures that we're considering. So for us, we look at it and Water, we look at about how the need to understand gender and other impacts uh, as risk amplifiers that need to be managed, they need to be addressed and managed through adaptation measures. So adaptations are not gender, gender neutral, climate change is not gender neutral, wash is not gender neutral. All of these things need to acknowledge the current risk factors and then manage them, address them through their work. Also, adaptation should deliver or sustain access to wash services that meet requirements of women and girls and marginalized people and improve their resilience to the impact of climate change. So we have done a lot of work to try and make wash services uh, more gender responsive. But if we don't then make the adaptations more gender responsive as well, then we will go backwards in terms of progress. There needs to be, as a sector overall, more attention to collecting and improving sex, age, disability, disaggregated data in relation to water, sanitation and hygiene so that we know uh, how different people experience these human basic human needs, but also how they uh, experience the productive needs and the climate impacts as well. So we need to be collecting this disaggregated data more. We need to continue to focus on participatory water resource mapping, who uses what, how and when, and this needs to be the basis of, of where we start the planning. Um, and as WaterAid, we try very hard to improve our ability to engage in with women's associations and women's user groups, for example, in water safety planning, in climate responsive water um, management decisions. So having this partnership with, with women's associations or women's organizations helps us to build our understanding and then our ability to respond. Overall, my last point is that in, we, we as a WASH organization need to focus on these partnerships with women's organizations, organizations of people with, disability, with disabilities, so that we can better coordinate and approach inclusive adaptation responses together. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Priya. That was that was excellent. Thank you. And I'm not going to re, not going to re-summarise your uh, your excellent presentation. Um, but I think the, the the points that struck me is about it's not just about consultation. It's about empowerment. And I think that's absolutely sort of the watchword for this uh, for this whole process. And then also, I think it was your fourth slide, uh, which sort of broke down what that you know a bit more about what that means in terms of implementing projects, which is about. Uh, accountability about taking time to uh, consult and to talk to people and empower people and get things right about investing in that process uh, and you know and realizing that it's got huge value if you work with, uh, with with communities but also different groups in those communities and also lastly about persistence and about uh, recognizing there's a long there's a long game here to be played to uh, you know especially if we're talking about climate change where there will only be increasing impacts until we get on top of things so thank you very much and uh, now uh, let's uh, turn to our, our panel, our first member of the panel, who is um, uh, Dr. Salim Huck, who uh, need, I hope doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he's director for the International Center for Climate Change and Development and is a lifelong campaigner 
uh, for uh, on climate change and development and an inspiration for many in terms of uh, bringing uh, the, the reality of climate change home in terms of what it means for communities in the global south. So, uh, Dr. Huck, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you uh, to Priya for that excellent presentation. I'll make um, three sets of remarks uh, uh, in relation to the topic under discussion today. Uh, the first set is to, um, to frame it uh, as you've already done, that water is to adaptation to climate change like energy is to mitigation. Um, that is not really fully understood. It is increasingly understood, but not fully understood. Uh, almost every impact of climate change has some element of water, either too much water in terms of floods or uh, cyclones, uh, too little water in terms of droughts and heat waves, uh, the wrong kind of water in terms of sea level rise uh, and salinity, um, and so on and so forth. So water is a very, very critical uh, part of the impacts of climate change story. And uh, the science of climate change now is very well understood. And the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, both the Working Group One of the scientists that came out in August last year, and the more recent uh, report of Working Group Two on impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation, have both reinforced a very strong game-changing message, which is that climate change is no longer something that will happen, that we have to prepare for, but something that is already happening, that we can attribute to the fact that global temperature has gone up over one degree centigrade and is causing impacts that are now attributable to that enhanced uh, uh, temperature rise. So we are now living in a world of climate change impacts, which are causing losses and damages, which we also need to now take into account. So uh, mitigation is needs to be ramped up so that we stay below 1.5 degrees. Uh, we have agreed to do that, but we are not doing enough to do that. Uh, and adaptation needs to be ramped up considerably uh, as well globally. Uh, one interesting uh, element of the Working Group 2 report was that adaptation is now required, not just in poor countries who have been suffering for some time, but even in the rich countries who are now suffering the impacts of climate change as well. And so it has become a truly global phenomena and the adaptation uh, measures and plans and implementation are lagging far, far behind. And so there's a lot of catching up to be done. Now, one of the good news stories that came out of the COP26 in Glasgow was that adaptation was recognized much more than it had been in the past. Um, the developed countries who were funding climate change in developing countries have been funding disproportionately mitigation activities and uh, uh, only partly adaptation uh, activities. They accepted that that was wrong. They uh, declared that they would double the adaptation funding over the next year or two. And indeed, many of them actually, while we were in Glasgow, uh, enhanced their contributions for adaptation funding. So that's a good sign. We hope that they will deliver on it and that uh, over the coming years, the $100 billion that has been promised a long time ago will actually be delivered, and then half of that will go for adaptation, whereas only a quarter has been going for adaptation so far. However, there is a, a corollary to that message of the, particularly the Working Group 2 report of the IPCC, that um, they have actually been able to study uh, quite a large number of adaptation activities that have been funded and implemented. And they have found quite disturbingly that many of them, not all, but many of them, have not been as effective as they had hoped. And they, some of them have in fact ended up in maladaptation. In other words, making things worse than they were before rather than better than they were before. And so having looked at those uh, uh, causalities of why that happened, the number one reason, not the only reason, but the, the number one reason was that by and large, these projects and funds would come with a very top-down uh, expert, so-called expert 
a level uh, intervention. The experts would come often from other countries uh, to a country with money and say, this is what you need to do. This is what the money needs to be spent on and tell the local government and the local people what they had to do with the money and assume that that would be done and that would be effective. Um, in fact, it proved in many cases not to be so. Um, and what they did not do was they did not consult the local people. They did not take the local knowledge into account in the planning. And most importantly, they did not take local social relationships into account in taking uh, the, the investments that they were making uh, to make them more in, uh, effective. And this again was recognized and, and over the last year and a half, there's been a movement which we are very much part of to promote what we now call locally led adaptation, uh, which the big donors, the international donors have all accepted. There are eight principles uh, uh, for locally led adaptation that many of them have signed up to. Now we need to see, uh, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And that's what the Goveshna conference is designed around. And I welcome uh, WaterAid uh, being part of it. And I invite WaterAid to continue to be part. It's not just a one-off conference. It's an annual event. We will hold it in the first quarter of each year, which is a few months after the, the previous COP is held. We will examine and use the conference itself to invite all the players in this, re in this realm uh, to tell us what they are doing and to see whether or not they actually are delivering on what they're promising to deliver in terms of supporting local actors. And uh, WaterAid already has a long history of doing that. We invite you to join forces with us in taking this idea forward and learning from the experience that you have. Not everybody has that experience. Uh, we need to reach out to those who wish to gain that experience and knowledge and uh, methodologies and share that with them. So I'll end by inviting WaterAid to continue to engage with us in Gobeshana. Think of yourselves as a partner uh, with us and each year we will reconvene and plan things. Now, as you know, the, the theme for this year's conference, uh, the one we are now in, is on connecting the local to the global decision-making and in particular aiming at COP27. And I know you were all present in COP26 in Glasgow. You had the Water Pavilion uh, where a lot of very good events would take, uh, would take place. I, I think I participated in one or two of them myself. Those are very good events for networking purposes uh, and, and meeting people from all over the world, like-minded people from all over the world. Uh, they are excellent events for networking and sharing knowledge, but they are really not uh, suited to influence the decision-making that is taking place behind closed doors where we don't have access. And so what we are now going to attempt is a much more ambitious uh, um, idea of not just going to the COP and holding side events in the pavilions and the side event rooms, but actually influencing the COP decision-making. And one of the lessons that we have learned, uh, I, I, I have been to every single COP uh, that's been held so far. And one of the lessons is, if you go to the COP expecting to influence a decision at the COP, you're too late because the agenda has, has already been set. You can't change the agenda. No country can. Uh, the agenda gets set six months earlier at the meeting of the subsidiary bodies, which takes place usually in June in Bonn in Germany, where the Secretariat of the UNFCC is located. And so if you really want to influence the decision making, you need to go to the SB meeting and it's actually much more uh, relatively easy, not easy, not very easy, but relatively easier to actually meet with negotiators in Bonn because there are less people there. It's not like the COP where there are tens of thousands of people and you just, nobody has time to talk to anybody. But in Bonn, they do. You can have a cup of coffee with them. You can talk to them. You can insert language that you think should be taken into the various decision-making processes. There will be workshops, uh, a workshop on the global goal on adaptation, a workshop on the Glasgow dialogue on uh, uh, finance for loss and damage. 
There will be a workshop on the Santiago network on loss and damage. So there are workshops opportunities where observers, those of us who are observers, can participate and we can actually have our voices heard and hopefully listened to, not just heard, but actually listened to. And so we will be attempting to do that. I invite WaterAid to join us because I know you have participated in these events in the past. I hope you'll continue to do that. And one of the outcomes I hope that we will have from this governor uh, is a group of organizations who are willing to join forces going forward, go to the uh, SB meeting in June, work together, and then work towards COP27 uh, in November in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt as well. And so hopefully we can do better at getting our uh, our advocacy into decisions rather than just simply holding networking events and talking about things, uh, but not being listened to. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Huck. And uh, you know, I mean, first of all, absolutely to accept the challenge for WaterAid to get uh, more, more involved in this this process. Uh, and it, and it's, I mean, you made the point there about bridging the sort of local to global. And I think for WaterAid is as as Priya made clear, and as uh, Hassan will later, it's almost the other way around for us is that I think that some of the engagement on the ground with communities, with civil society and water aid is already, you know, very well developed. Of course, there's always more to do. And it's actually, it's the global arm of water aid, which needs to catch up and link those two things. Um, and also, I mean, since we've, we're speaking of global, we have obviously Andrew here from um, the, the Global Center for Adaptation. And, um, uh, Andrew is the leader for local adaptation at the Global Centre, I believe. And given the, the thought leadership role that the Global Centre has taken on, a uh, very big challenge indeed for such a young sector, um, it'd be really great to hear from you now about um, about how in the ambitious, ambitious programmes uh, and uh, policy, uh, global policies you're taking on, how to link that that global with the local. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for inviting me. I'm not sure I have the answer to that question quite yet, but uh, we're, we'll work on it together. So, uh, as Jonathan said, I work with the Global Centre on Adaptation, which is a fairly young organisation. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. So, the GCA was set up in 2018 uh, with the main goal of accelerating solutions and uh, action on adaptation. And uh, the, the biggest program we have so far is in Africa. It's called the Af Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, the AAAP, with, and uh, that has four pillars. So we have one on the Africa Infrastructure Resilience Accelerator, which is about infrastructure, but very much along the lines of what Priya described. It's not about the hardware, but it's about the uh, impact on people's lives when um, infrastructure is damaged. We have a program on climate smart digital technologies for agriculture and food um, uh, security. We have a program on empowering youth through entrepreneurships and job creation and a program on innovative financial initiatives for Africa. So uh, this was uh, the AAAP was one of the first GCA programs that was set up. And uh, LLA, locally led adaptation, is integrated and embedded into these four pillars. So the way we're doing it right now, really, because I mean, the, the challenge as we see it is really how do we achieve scale and speed? And how do we start influencing the big funding? Because as I'm sure you'll all agree, when it comes to locally led efforts, there are you know, a lot of really good examples out, out there, not just in the adaptation context, but all the work that you've been doing in water aid and the years and years of development, uh, you know, uh, work that we've all been doing, where we're trying pretty much to push for the same things. So, so why, why haven't we, you know, managed to achieve the same scale that uh, others have? And I think that's one of the big questions that we're trying to answer. And the way we're trying to um, address it is to look at how we can start influencing big projects funded by MDBs, by governments, et cetera, and, and, and embed these um, elements of not just adaptation, but of locally led adaptation into the, the projects and activities of MDBs. And we work closely in Africa. The, uh, the GCA office is based in the AFDB office, and we have an MOU together. So AAAP is very much a program of both. 
And uh, what we basically, so it's, it's not easy, I'll tell you, because particularly for locally led adaptation, I mean, given the time scales of these projects, given the, uh, and, and as you all know, locally led approaches take more time, they sometimes cost more money, which is kind of where the GCA comes in to say that, you know, we will bear the extra cost of that locally led element. But uh, it's also the country context. So there are different countries at different levels of devolution that's possible. And, and what we're trying to see is how can we move the needle slowly, you know, from, the, from beneficiaries to contributors, to partners, to actual drivers, where can we make that little bit of a change? It's, it's challenging, but that's what we've started to do right now. Now, in addition to AAAP, very recently, we've also launched a global hub on locally led adaptation in our office in Dhaka. And uh, the, the office was inaugurated by the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in 2020. And the activities of the hub are, are literally just taking off this year. Our main focus uh, for the first year will be knowledge acceleration, which is basically to capture all this wonderful knowledge that already exists on adaptation so that we're not, you know, repeating and we're not replicating. We have an agreement with Gobishona with Salim to document all that's presented at Gobishona, and we're going to sort of condense that, use that on knowledge platforms, make it available. Also, you know, uh, come up with a publication for uh, COP27. So that's going to be a very big focus for us. These are this is going to be knowledge acceleration with a purpose because the the you know as solution breakers, uh, brokers one of the big roles that we see for the GCA is partnerships, and partnerships you know it's something we talk about but we don't really think of the power of actual partnerships because what we have currently are perhaps silos where you have small organizations, NGOs that are really good at doing locally led efforts, but then you have the bigger MDBs, you have the governments, they are the ones with the money, they are the ones that, you know, have a, a bigger reach, but uh, they're less able to take these approaches on board. So how do we create those partnerships? That's a, a big question for us and that we're trying to work on. On capacity very much uh, in, you know, using the capacity that already exists, but in, in providing capacities in ways that it actually can be sustained, that it's not something that, you know, fades away at the end of a project, it's built into government systems, it's built into community institutions, how do we achieve that? And finally, of course, finance, because in the context of LLA, the way it's been previously really is that uh, bilateral donors uh, have funded quite a few innovative approaches around the world, but uh, not so much national governments when they invest in adaptation and development, not so much uh, international financial institutions. So how do we bridge the gap and how do we bring about those partnerships to make the bigger organizations invest as well? These are sort of the, the uh, activities of the global hub over the first year. We have initiated one very exciting project that I'll describe to you in uh, a little bit of detail because I think it, uh, it has a relevance to your sector and the learning that from that project is fantastic. We, we are building a toolkit based on an approach in Mukuru, which is an informal settlement in Nairobi in Kenya, where, uh, you know, it, 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 they, it's a community driven approach where the communities themselves were able to set off a process which is in complete partnership with the local uh, government, where, where the local government's committed to a planning process by which the planning that the residents of Mukuru, which is a fairly big informal settlement with 300,000 inhabitants, uh, they will sort of integrate that into the Nairobi uh, plan over the coming years. And uh, the approach that was followed over a period of two years in Mukuru managed to achieve quite spectacular scale and depth. So, you know, it went right down to the household level. They were able to cover the entire uh, Mukuru area. It was very impressive also, I think, because uh, they managed to achieve a cross-sectoral approach, which is something we all struggle with. 
and uh, they realize very early, and I'm sure that Water Aid has this experience as well, that particularly when you're dealing with issues like water, it often, it, it, it's not helpful to just sort of look at it in that silo because water management has to do with waste management, et cetera. And so they, they realized that very early on and they, they set up, they, they got the NGOs that were working in Mukuru to all push in the same direction to form coalitions and to contribute to this process. So, so they had a, a structure where the, uh, they, were, they identified about seven key priorities for the communities. They had coalitions for each one of these. These coalitions were led by the local government. So there was real ownership there. There was confidence among the people that this was a process, not just another planning process, but that, that this would go somewhere. And they, they also um, managed to do a fairly uh, you know, uh, impressive sort of accountability capacity measures while uh, implementing the project. So we're trying to do document that in a toolkit and then use that experience. I mean, to, uh, it, it was also interesting because the way that they went about it was that uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, an external agent that came out and uh, tried to build capacity and tell the uh, inhabitants of Mukuru what their problems were, but they, it preceded this whole exercise with a fairly detailed enumeration exercise where the communities got a chance to actually uh, do a mapping of Mukuru to understand what their challenges were, what potential solutions were. And that just gave them so much, uh, a much better uh, leverage or sort of uh, power to engage with their governments and to explain very clearly what was needed and what they wanted. And, and with remarkable results, they were able to reduce the need for displacement by around 60%, I think, from earlier plans that would have provided the same services. So really, I mean, I think going forward, of course, one of the big challenges we all have is the question of funding and uh, LLA and how do we get it out of that uh, niche? It's about partnerships. And I think when thinking about these partnerships, we all have to realize that perhaps we will feel threatened in, in uh, you know, thinking that uh, if we partner with somebody, we lose out on some elements, but we really have to take that leap of faith and we have to create real partnerships. We have to have accountability systems very clearly stated in the LLA principles, not just to providers of funding, but also to communities and how do we make them, uh, you know, the, the service providers accountable to them. And of course, the capacity uh, uh, building question as well. So I'll stop there, Jonathan, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Angie, and uh, some really good points there. I mean, I think definitely the point you made about, you know, we need to, you know, this uh, bridging the global to local is, is as much about bridging uh, to multilateral development banks and to donors and recognizing it's not just as uh, Dr. Huck was talking about, about uh, imposing technical solutions, but it's also about telling the stories of what's happening on the ground to donors, but also so donors can feel like they're, the both sides can feel they're part of the process. And then that point you're making about absolutely about breaking down silos, which I think for the water sector, because water connects so many aspects of life, whether it's health or um, you know, energy or education or food, that it's you know it's, it's one area where we we have to break out those silos. We can't. There's no there's no water sector because we we undercut so much. So uh, it's you know it's really about how do you reflect that in in the way the programs are implemented. And so with that, thank you, Andrew, and I'll uh, now. Uh, hand over to, to Hassan Jahan, who is um, our uh, country director in Bangladesh. And uh, for all the credit which WaterAid uh, may or may not get for our work on climate change and, and working with communities, a lot of it has to go to Hassan and her team in Bangladesh, who've been doing amazing work and have been leading almost all the practical stuff we've done in this area. So with that in mind, uh, over to you, Hassan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh... I'm honored. Um, let me start by thanking Priya for her wonderful presentation. And I was kind of trying to relate our um, topic of today's discussion with everyone's uh, speech. And from Priya, I just picked the uh, sentence like, um, we really need to call for gender responsive uh, adaptation. So that is my takeaway from her. Uh, presentation and when we, I was listening to uh, Dr. Hawk, I found that uh, the thing 
came quite prominently that water and adaptation. These two actually coexist. We cannot take one uh, rejecting others. So all both of them actually coexist. Uh, from Anju's um, uh, speech, uh, we get to know uh, the challenges of a scaling of uh, uh, LLA, which is really, really important. And um, I understand that uh, approach of work is very important. And that is the center of everything. And let me share with you that WaterAid recently developed its global strategy where we are considering uh, gender equality as one of our approaches. And we do consider water security as a whole for our climate change uh, program because we understand that water security is not uh, critically defining what an individual is needing for uh, uh, as a basic requirement, rather what requirement is essential for livelihood, for biodiversity, those also come to a certain level uh, along with integrated uh, waste management. So um, if I come back to my uh, today's discussion point uh, and from my own experience, I, I just want to share my thoughts here. Uh, I mean, we talk about uh, people and there is no pathway to succeed without inclusion. Climate leaders are the people in communities everywhere who are adapting to climate impacts. My main lesson from working in the water and sanitation sector is that climate leaders generally don't attend UN meetings. So we are trying to actually highlight their work through our experience and uh, we, we, are, we just like to share that what we can do more to foster and support that local leadership. In the villages located around Sundarbon, that is our coastal belt, um, mostly women bear the cost of adapting to climate change. Men are often out fishing in the rivers for several days, months, uh, or several, sometimes they travel to distant places for, uh, in search of jobs and women are left there and they have to travel more than two to four kilometers every day for a few hours to secure drinking water. They take care of rest of their family members, including aged parents, children, and the women and girls are the worst sufferer of cyclone shelters. For example, they don't have private space there for changing their pets or rags during menstruation. Dropout rate of girls uh, from schools is a very common uh, uh, phenomena in our coastal belt. An excessive ingestion of saline water posing health impacts like increasing hypertension and eclampsia. So WaterAid has been working to improve water access, which reduces the burden on these communities, especially for women and children. And taking the time to gather this local knowledge is crucial to understand the right approach, but also to involve people in their choice about their future. It is, um, it is also means having to look at some solutions like rainwater harvesting, reverse osmosis plans to deal with increasing salinity of groundwater that we are observing in the coastal belt. Often this goes beyond just household wash infrastructure itself, and it involves uh, looking at schools, healthcare facilities, uh, cyclone shelters to improve the overall resilience of the people. In that spirit, uh, we have, uh, have also been working with the communities, the schools, healthcare facilities in the climate hotspots to ensure they are the part of planning process and seen as a part of the entire water system. These communities need help and support, but they are not remaining as victims waiting for help, but are getting on with what they actually need. For example, in our coastal belt, we have introduced a model of water entrepreneurship led by women groups to run water businesses in the locality. They are running reverse osmosis plants, selling water within the catchment, ensuring inclusive services in an affordable manner, making little profit and also creating res uh, reserve for 
future operation and maintenance of the plants, considering the sustainability. To our surprise, um, one of them actually became the woman um, elected as the local government representative very recently. It can be um, very hard to change existing practices and gain attention to poor communities, but much more than the technical challenges of climate resilience. This intersection between climate change and the lives of the working people in the real challenge of climate change that we must overcome. As we had uh, into, we are heading towards uh, COP27. It is a good, it is good to see that conference is, uh, this conference is trying to shape the agenda well ahead and shed light on these issues. And uh, let's hope for the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hasina Ba. Uh, this is really interesting uh, insights from all three panel members, especially starting from the work we have been doing in the root level, especially from water aid's end, and especially uh, the initiative taken by the Global Center for Adaptation, recognizing that adaptation practice should be uh, ramped up in places like Bangladesh. So um, I'll go into the question answer round. And we have three questions um, uh, to three of our members. So I'll, the first question is to Ms. Sharma. Uh, it's from Mr. Partho Sheikh. How can we make gender-based approach more inclusive, especially for locally led adaptation practices? Uh, Ms. Anju, um, if you could answer that question. Thanks, Adnan. So that's not an easy question, but um, I think what we need in the first instance is a lot more deliberate and affirmative action. So for instance, uh, when Nepal did their local adaptation plan of action, one of the things they, they committed to was that 50% of the funding for these LAPAs would go, uh, would, you know, it, it would be gender balanced and it, it would go to women. So maybe what we need is for international institutions, national governments to make these sort of commitments that they will make sure that uh, women, you know, are equal partners in adaptation action. But I think also what uh, a, a lot needs to be done in terms of empowerment and capacity building, because often uh, it's, it's, it's as much, it's, Women just don't feel like they're, you know, they can contribute it, but when they're pushed into it, we had actually a very interesting experience at COP26 where we got together women leaders in the UNFCCC. So this is really high up. These are, you know, women from around the world working on the climate change negotiations. And when we sat down to hear each other's stories, it was really shocking how each and every one of those didn't feel that they could, you know, contribute or that they, they were uh, good enough to take leadership positions in the UNFCCC. And they had to be pushed to do it. So I think we need very much something similar on, on the ground where we have this process of empowering women to come up, take leadership positions and uh, be equally represented. So it's a bit of both, I think. Thanks. Thank you. So um, if I ask Priya to answer the same questions, I think um, each of the organizations wear different hats. And I think everyone has the same goals if we are trying to make more gender inclusive approaches. So um, Priya, if I ask you the same question, how can we make as water aid um, LLA more inclusive for gender? Like what would be our thought? Thanks, Adnam. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Anju has just said. I think for, for us and our learning around how to make WASH more gender responsive, it has to come to the, uh, to focus on working closer with women and girls in every part of the equation and every part of our design. It has to be about working at the local level. It has to be about thinking about the systems level. So what are the policies? What are the 
the um, the decision making bodies, what are the technical solutions that need to change to be more gender responsive? How do these all parts of the system understand and address these differences that men and women have uh, from each other and, and within, within even different groups of women? So it's about understanding barriers and then shifting the things in at different levels to be more responsive, to be more understanding of those different barriers that different people face. Thank you so much. Dr. Hawk, do you have any remarks on that topic in particular? Well, let me uh, combine uh, my answer to the uh, question on gender with, with the question that's been put in the chat box uh, specifically for me, which is on youth as well, and uh, answer it in the practical uh, way and the sector that I'm in, which is in the university setting. Okay, so as you know, the Gobeshana uh, platform emanated from universities in Bangladesh working on climate change, coming together and sharing our knowledge and experience. And over the years, uh, we would hold this annual conference as a in-person conference at my university in Dhaka. We'd get several hundred people over sev uh, several days uh, to come and share their experiences. And we actually had sessions for women leaders. I think Hasin was one of the, the women leaders that we uh, celebrated in, in one of our sessions a, cup, a couple of years ago. So what we are trying to do now is to build that second generation of women leaders. The girls uh, who are our students are the future of our country. Uh, particularly the girls, the boys as well, but the girls in particular. They have a very special role to play in becoming the leaders in all kinds of arenas, government servants, technical people, engineers, doctors, uh, uh, and so on, lawyers, and private sector entrepreneurs. They can be the leaders of the future of the country. And if they do that, they can transform the country in the coming years, uh, uh, and I truly believe that. It, I'll, I'll just share an anecdote. Just before this um, meeting earlier today, I was invited to a consultation by the World Bank. So uh, Anju was talking about influencing the big institutions like the World Bank. You don't get bigger than the World Bank. And the World Bank comes with a huge amount of hubris. They know everything. They know what is right. They have billions of dollars and they give you the billions and they tell you what to do with the billions, okay? That's how they work. They have brilliant people. They have very, very clever people. I don't doubt that, but they don't know everything. And in particular, they don't know what the local people know and they don't value what the local people value. And my advice to them was to change their way of thinking and to consult with the local people and value the knowledge of the local people and include that knowledge and experience in um, their own planning, in their own implementation, in their own monitoring and evaluation of what is effective, because local people have a very different evaluation of what the World Bank does uh, than what their evaluators, global evaluators, tell them that they've done. And the one thing that I said would make a huge difference is the, the university cohort of young girls and also young boys, but particularly young girls in Bangladesh. We have more than 100 universities. We have tens of thousands of young people who are very bright, very energetic, very capable of learning how to solve problems. The tragedy is we're not teaching them how to solve problems. We're teaching them how to pass an exam. We're teaching them the wrong things. So we need to change what we teach our, our young people. But if we do it right, then they are a huge asset and they will be the solution of the future, in my view. This, I, I strongly believe this. And, and uh, so to me, young people, particularly young girls, and make them into leaders. Thank you, Dr. Hawk. Interesting insight. And I, we do agree that when we go through the education system, uh, things are taught, but when it comes to implementation, youth, especially youth, they struggle. And I think there are different organizations who try to reach out to them. And I think the question came from Kafi. He is actually a volunteer from Jago Foundation. 
and they are trying to implement ground root level um, inclusive um, work. But I think your insight will definitely help his cohort take forward how to implement better plans in the future. So the third question um, came from Khadija Asan. Um, she wrote, how can sectors like water aid, GCA, and even ICAD, how can um, these three institutes make wash practices more streamlined so that we don't go towards more maladaptation practices? I'm pretty sure um, the thought process here was that how do we differentiate what works and what doesn't, especially in light of the uh, COP that will take place in Egypt, um, the question of loss and damage, which Dr. Hawk already mentioned. So I'll start off with um, water aid. Um, Hassin, if you could um, answer that, then I'll go to Anju, then I'll come back to Dr. Hawk. So the last question is for me. Okay, um, uh, just before uh, responding to this question, I would like to uh, uh, sorry. Uh, before responding to your question, let me add to the previous uh, question that we do understand the importance of uh, uh, mainstreaming or involving women from planning to uh, implementation, monitoring, and in the decision making of their own infrastructures and uh, approaches, all these things. But what we are seeing right now that at community level, we are trying our best to ensure the women participation, empowerment and putting them into decision making position. But what is happening in the central level, in the policy making level of the government? When we sit in the table, when the government is deciding its own policy, we have found that all male are there and male dominating policies are being developed. So if women are not in the senior level positions, especially in the governments and you know in different uh, organizations, if women are not uh, uh, being addressed, uh, I mean, taken to that position and they are not participating in policy making. So never ever the policy will be woman friendly. So that has to be understood. And Water Aid has taken an initiative to train the graduating um, women uh, or female students. Uh, so we are training them both on subject matters like WASH, climate change and others. At the same time, leadership traits and leadership skill so, so that we actually create female woman leader in the sector. So that is one of our efforts that we have been taken. Now coming to your next question, how we can make the wash adaptation more streamlined. Uh, the first of all, when we talk about locally led adaptation and eight principles, we actually yet to know that whether the WASH interventions are actually um, addressing all eight principles or not. So the first thing we went a few days back, a few months back, we tried to assess some technologies and trying to look at whether those technologies or those interventions are addressing all eight principles or not. So we found that yes, most of them, they are actually addressing all of them, except the biodiversity one, because WASH intervention is very point type of interventions. It's it is not possible always to address the, that principle through wash interventions. So this is one way that we assess existing wash technologies against the principles and add on different elements which will make uh, those interventions and approaches locally led adaptive. So we need to work more. The first we need to understand where we are right now, and then we have to understand what additional thing we need to put on into the system, into the work, into the interventions to make it LLA. And only then we can actually uh, rightly fit into the main system. And we can consider, uh, we can say that these are the locally led adaptive uh, wash technologies and approaches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hasina Pal. Um, same question to Ms. Sharma. How can we um, streamline adaptation practices so that we don't move towards maladaptation practices? Thanks, Adnan. So I think, I mean, the first thing we need there are more joined up solutions. 
you know, we call whether we call it integration or we call it mainstreaming, but uh, we 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 need solutions that don't just look at adaptation in a silo, but it's very well integrated into each of the different sectors and that there is also a, a, you know, a cross-sectoral overview. And often this is much easier at the local level than it is at the national level. So, so uh, instead of sending funding down to the local in these silos, what national governments and subnational governments need to do is allow for that flexibility at the local level for the planning to be fully integrated to have an overview to make adaptation an element into each and every one of these sectors. And if by streamlining we mean how do we make adaptation action more effective and how do we make it less um, maladaptation, I think there the, the question we have to ask ourselves is effective for whom, right? So the, uh, the people who sort of say whether it was effective or not in the end have to be the communities. And currently that's not what happens. So any monitoring and um, uh, you know verification that happens in the end is very much to the top from the bottom. So we have to kind of reverse that as well and start building accountability systems, which actually ask communities those questions and then, you know, work with them to figure out why the maladaptation happened, how it can be corrected. Because often, you know, I've seen situations where there are, there's a maladaptation precisely because sectors are not talking to themselves. So if they've tried to deal with water in a certain way, but you end up with a completely different weather system because of climate change, and farmers end up with flooding because measures were taking place to avoid drought. And uh, at the end of the day, the farmers have nowhere to go to. They can go and talk to engineers, but most government engineers, as you know, they're not very amenable to listening. So you end up creating more stress than uh, finding solutions. So really what we, uh, LLA, you could say, is one of the ways in which you can make uh, try to ensure that adaptation helps rather than hurts. Definitely, I agree with the last point. And if I come to Dr. Hawk, same question, sir, but we know ECAD has a plethora of knowledge regarding the adaptation practices that have been happening, plethora of research from your team, um, 10 years of experience. Uh, so, sir, if you could uh, answer the question, like, in terms of inclusive wash or inclusive gender practices, or even um, as Ms. Sharma mentioned about um, locally led adaptation, will we be able to do it without um, going to the other side or maladaptation practices? Well, my, my answer to the question is to um, emphasize the word inclusive and then unpack what we mean by inclusive. And there are several dimensions to the word inclusive. <clears throat> One of them, which we uh, focus on in locally led adaptation is including local people, uh, within local people, including women, uh, within local people, including more vulnerable people, the elderly, the disabled, uh, indigenous uh, uh, groups, etc. So inclusiveness means disaggregating uh, a given population. It could be in a location, it could be in a city, it could be in a country, and ensuring that every segment of the different groups are consulted, are included in the consultation, in the decision-making, <clears throat> and in the implementation. Now, this takes time. It takes a different mindset. Um, not everybody is agreeable to do that. They have to be persuaded and shown that it can be beneficial uh, to do it. Uh, so inclusiveness in terms of the different um, disaggregated uh, sectors of society. And, within, and having done that, I would say a very normative uh, view from any climate adaptation project designer will be to focus on prioritizing the most vulnerable. Having disaggregated the population and found out the different levels of vulnerability, who are the most vulnerable? And women will come out definitely as uh, one of the most vulnerable groups, but they may be also children, they may be also disabled groups. 
who are the most vulnerable and the design should be focusing on helping the most vulnerable that is a normative statement that should be part of their design find out who's most vulnerable and then design your interventions to help the most vulnerable not to help the less vulnerable but the most vulnerable that's a normative uh, objective that they must have then there's another dimension the one that we just spoke of is that we are very sectorally divided uh, even ngos are sectorally divided some work on education some work on agriculture some work on wash uh, like water aid etc governments are absolutely divided ministry of agriculture does agriculture ministry of water does water they don't talk to each other most of the time uh, and so how do we break these silos and that is another form of inclusiveness bringing the different sectoral and technical silos uh, together and then having them talk to the local people so at one level it's government uh, uh, what we call a whole of government approach and then at the other level it's including non-governmental actors what we call a whole of society approach these are two conceptual framings that uh, wants to break down barriers now all of this is very difficult uh, it goes against tradition uh, people have been doing things in one way they are not going to want to change what they're doing they think they're doing it the right way so changing the mindset is very important and that's where climate change as an entry point is somewhat useful because climate change is new nobody's done climate change before okay they may have done engineering they may have done uh, you know uh, uh, water management but they didn't do climate change climate change is a relatively new subject and so when you enter the conversation and you bring people together to talk about dealing with climate change and adapting to climate change in particular it's a new subject everybody has to listen to it they have to learn it and you can then bring them together to say, well, you can't solve it on your own. Water board can't solve it on their own. LGD cannot solve it on their own. Ministry of Agriculture cannot solve it on their own. They need to work together. They need a much more integrated uh, planning process at the planning level, and then they need a much more integrated and inclusive uh, consultation process and including local government. So climate change being new allows this opportunity to think anew to do things differently. That to me is an advantage, but it's not easy. It's going to take a lot of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoff. And we understand um, it's not easy. That's why we are here. We have more than 40 participants here and we have been trying. I think everyone's trying to change that narrative. Um, I think there are no further questions. I'll hand over to John uh, to do the closing remarks. John, over to you. Uh, thank you, Adnan. And uh, first of all, say thanks to Adnan for all his work. He's sort of unsung hero of this uh, mm -hmm. uh, this event. Uh, has done most of the organising, most of the hard work. So just to uh, give him credit for for his efforts on, on making it all happen. Um, uh, but and then to sort of to give us sort of a short summary. Oh, Salim Huck has put his hand up. Do you want to say? No, something? no. I just wanted to say thank you to Adnan. Well done. Um, Adam's the best. Um, and uh, just to just to give my my sort of final reflections uh, before handing briefly back to Adnan to close us out, uh, there was an excellent uh, phrase that Andrew used earlier, which is about uh, working with communities and moving them from beneficiaries uh, to partners and to drivers. And I think you know, that is a, that is a journey that has to take place. We can't leapfrog that journey. And, it, and uh, you know, this point was also made that you know there's a, this yes, local adaptation is definitely the way the only way I feel that we can realize the changes that have to happen in response to this global crisis but we can't we can't do it tomorrow it's also a burden it's a you know involves learning it involves understanding and uh but it, you, know, you know that drivers part of recognizing that for organizations like water aid and for you know, and the world bank and for everyone else we're here we're, we're servants to the community we're here to support them we're you know, we're, you know they're not our customers they are you know that we're there to sort of make sure that uh the changes they want to see we can we can realize and um with that you know, with that in mind uh the i guess the message if there was one for for cop is not so much a sort of one line this is our demand it's a it's a request that you know with all the wonderful work we've seen on mitigation 
on bringing the world together to realize change that mindset change of you know this we're you know, we're the experts we're the global north we're here to change things needs to flip and realize well actually the people making the changes the people doing the work are already in communities in the global south and therefore we're there we should be working out what we can do to accelerate enhance invest in their work and that and, and then we'll be we better stand back and look at a resilient world a low carbon world a world where environment is respected and not exploited and that so that is my my hope and as uh, as priya said you know we need to persist in that in that so um once again thank you so much to to priya for for setting things up so well to dr huck for this conference and for taking part in our event to uh for andrew for her her leadership for the global center adaptation and of course to hassin for her continuing work to champion um uh, climate resilience uh, in, you know, through through wash systems and in, and in Bangladesh. And uh, thanks to Adnan, back to you.